Um, I want to introduce myself. My name is Richard Shear, and uh, I am a uh, Montpelier, longtime Montpelier resident, District 2. And um, I do not sit on the school board. I've never sat on the school board. Uh, next to me is the school board chair, Jim Murphy. And he, he's been the chair for how long? Since 2018, so six years, I think. He's paid the big bucks to make those decisions. How much does the school chair make? $1,500 a year. That's the big bucks. Yes. Uh, Orca is filming this tonight, and I'll ask that if you have a question, please identify yourself, wait a second so that she can kind of swing the camera around, and um, tell us where you're from. If you're from Roxbury or from Montpelier, tell us, please. And I... We do not have a moderator tonight for a reason. We, we know each other. We, we've been collaborating for years. We've been not collaborating for years. But I can tell you that this man answers each and every email I send in a very respectful and very complete manner. Thank you. Um, Jim is going to represent the board and the, uh, the upcoming budget. He's going to advocate for it. And I am going to oppose the upcoming budget for very particular reasons, um, and they have to do with fiscal management. I keep in mind, this is not blood sport. You know, we're, we're going to ask everybody to please be respectful and, and not come two guns a-blazing. A um, but feel free, after we've sat and made our short presentations, to ask any and all questions, and we will attempt to answer them. Some of this is going to be really technical, particularly when we're going to open up with Act 127. Yeah. And 127 is floating as we as we speak. You know, it's it's very fluid up in the state house. Very fluid. And it's going to require something that only a few in this room probably understand, and that's the concept of CLA. The concept of how property is appraised, and I want to get two things down at the very, very beginning of this. One, the Roxbury tax rate is not half of the Montpelier tax. It's it, it's kind it's a complicated story as to how they arrive at a different tax rate than we do, but they're not getting a tax break that we're not getting. Yeah. So I want to get that down right off the bat, so that that's off the table. Second, there is a quality education to be had at Union Elementary School. I will testify to that. Our son went through Union Elementary School. It was absolutely a great experience that helped to shape him, not only educationally, but as a person. And we do have room at Montpelier Union Elementary School for more kids without adding staff. So I want to get those two off the table and now we're going to turn to what could be a very, very difficult discussion, Act 127. Start with the history, please. Um, well, first of all, I want to clarify a couple things. I, I am not here to advocate for the budget. I'm here to explain the budget as a board. We do not tell you how to vote. Um, you know, I will tell you that the, the budget was passed unanimously by the board. Uh, the board took a long time to consider the budget. We considered it for about two months under a very fluid situation with the state, which was Act 127. Uh, that situation is still fluid. Uh, we cannot tell you how that's going to end up. Uh, we can't tell you what the, you know, it, it came at us one way. It changed midstream. Uh, what the effect of that is going to, on our tax rate is going to be is, is hard for us to know. Uh, that is because of a very complicated formula and a lot of dynamics that, that happened with Act 27. Um, the bottom line is, is what the board focused on was the educational needs of our kids. Uh, we have uh, focused on systems that uh, want to achieve academic excellence, uh, support the wellness, uh, the belonging and well-being of our, our kids and staff. Um, and keep our facilities we're at the level they need to be. Uh, and we passed what is essentially a level budget. And what I mean by level budget is we just basically continued 
uh, what we were doing from last year. We actually uh, cut a few positions uh, and we reduced some spending, uh, some kind of discretionary spending to try to control costs. Uh, the overall impact on local taxes, well, we cut some positions, but we also moved some federal positions into the local budget. So the, the local budget was basically kept level, uh, but the overall effect was that we, we reduced some positions. Um, we felt this was the best thing for our schools. The questions we asked our administrators was, what do you need to do to make sure that we have the educational excellence for kids that, um, that our kids deserve? There was nothing new thrown in. We did not throw in any new projects. We did not put bells and whistles on. We did not add positions. Again, it's a, it's a net reduction in positions. Um, and, and we went on what our administrators told us was was the best thing to do. Uh, the question of, of Roxbury Village School has come up. I'm not here to advocate for or to advocate against Roxbury Village School. Uh, the school, as I think Richard is going to point out, um, is expensive and there are some educational challenges there <clears throat> that I will not dispute at all. Um, what we decided to do, what the board was reluctant to do, was to close that school, which has been the centerpiece of the Roxbury community for a long, long time and is a very important part of that community, was to take this year and by the next budget cycle, which starts in fall, uh, form a committee, which we've already formed, to look at that school and see what the best course of action is, uh, including closing that school and bringing the kids to Union Elementary School. We want to do it in a way that's fair and inclusive to uh, both communities, uh, that listens to the voices of Roxbury. Um, I've spent time in Roxbury. There's a couple members from the Roxbury community here. Uh, I have not gotten any sentiment that Roxbury uh, residents think that UES is a bad place for their kids to be educated. Um, but they do like, many of them do like their school. They like having a small local school um, and I think they want a fair discussion of, about its future. And, and I think there's also the possibility that many of them may think that UES is the best option. Uh, that's a discussion we want to have. I just want to bring, you know, when small schools are closed in Vermont, this is the type of study. This is a small school that was closed in Mansfield. This is the type of study that takes place. We did not have time to do this type of study. We did not have time to look at the numbers, to get the public input. That's what we're committed to doing, and I understand two things. I understand, one, we could have started this earlier, and there's reasons we didn't, but some of them are excuses. We could have started as early. I will just concede that off the bat. Um, and two, it, it would have a difference on our taxes this year, but we, the board, very strongly felt that the time frame that we had to make that decision was simply too short. We could not hear from the communities and we could not move forward. I, I can either give you a moment or I can dive into Act 127 and, and why it's, it's Well, I, I have better. a question on 127. Yeah. Uh, what was the legislation? Uh, again, I was yeah. hoping you'd give an overview of 127, yeah. and then I was hoping that you would speak to 127 next year, the following year, the following year, and the fo is this a one-year phenomenon with the district having to nip and tuck to meet well with with what so how 127 was really passed was the crux of 127 the the education formula is complicated math I mean, you, you, could, you could teach a course on it i think all of you could spend a semester in a college level course on it and still have questions about how and why it's, it's structured the way it is it's on the most basic level it's, it tries to, it came out of Act, the, the education form, it came out of Act 60, which tried to equalize spending. So it's, a, it's essentially a combination of a state education fund that's distributed to schools, and then local tax payers pick up the remainder of what the, the state education fund doesn't allocate. The state education fund is distributed based on what's called a weighted pupil scale. Uh, so 
weighted pupils are they, they take all the students and then they assign weights to them basically based on their educational <clears throat> needs. Uh, what happened with Act 1, and then you know, districts are assigned a certain number of students, and that certain number of students basically determines the amount of money from the state per pupil that that district gets, which is called the dollar yield. The more money that a district gets, the more students a district has, and the more money per pupil that the state gives the district, the lower the property tax. The fewer students a district has, and the fewer dollars that that dollar yield gives to the state, the higher the property tax. So what Act 127 did on its face was it changed the weights. So, so what it so for instance, you know, a student that might be weighted, no one, no very few are weighted at one to one, might be rated say like a 1.1, became a 2.5. And some that might have been weighted like a one went down to a 0.5. So that weighting shifted and it was based on need. And the, the districts that, that gained under that were generally in two categories. Some of our more urban districts with a higher diversity population, particularly students who have English as their second language because it's very resource intensive to educate those students. Um, Winooski, for instance, gained greatly under this. And the other were some of our uh, lower income rural districts who also have a lot of students who are um, more expensive and have higher needs to educate. Montpelier lost because we actually have most of our students, not all of our students, um, are not as high needs as some others. So, so that number of, of pupils as a result of the act went down which means, again, our pupils go down, local taxes go up. We expected that. What the legislature did to try to, so what they realized is that, okay, some districts are gonna, some districts are gonna gain and some districts are gonna lose funds. The districts that lose funds, we wanna blunt the impact. So what we're going to do is we're gonna, ta we're gonna cap the amount of property tax that those districts can can have. So even if, even if the, the shift would result in, say, a 12% increase in property tax, we're going to cap that at five. So what happened is all the, all the money from the Ed Fund, which is you know, this size, shifted over this way to the districts that, that gained. But what happened with the districts that lost, and I hate to use the word lost, but the districts that were disadvantaged, is the, the state said, we're not going to shift all of that proportionately to your local income tax. We're going to backfill some of that with the education fund too. So the education fund got stretched in two directions. And then on top of it, what some districts did was they said, great, our local property tax is a tax is capped at 5%. What a great year to put in a bunch of projects that we otherwise would have to bond or put on our local property taxes, but now the Ed Fund's gonna cover it, so the state's gonna cover it. So, so a bunch of districts did that. So between it being stretched just by design and then stretched by people saying, hey, it's, it's basically a free lunch, I'm gonna stuff my pockets with as much food as possible. The Ed Fund got stretched hugely and that dollar yield, that per pupil amount from the state plummeted. It went from, when, when the legislature finally realized what it did, it had plummeted, it was heading towards 50% of what it was the year before, which means all of that money that, that the, that the uh, state was, was giving us the year before shifted from not affecting our property tax to like, okay, now that the, the citizens of Montpelier and Roxbury need to make up that gap, which is why we had the huge numbers we did. So basically we had a level funded budget and, and the increases came in, in two places mainly because um, it, is, it, it is an increase, but it, again, it's not because we added stuff. It's because we have increased expenses. And that, those two things dropped, our number of students 
and the amount we got from the state. And they both dropped significantly. So, so basically the, the state piece of the pie went like this, which means that you know, the accordion side on the, the local property tax <coughs> went like that. Um, and the, the two areas that influence virt most of our, our spending increase, um, we gave our teachers, as did pretty much all districts across the state, uh, a sizable adjustment in their, in their compensation of 8%, um, which was done with the fact that Vermont as a whole was lagging. Uh, we need to stay competitive with other districts. And our teachers are very valuable. They are getting to the point where, like, let's be honest, a, a, a teacher uh, is going to have a hard time living in Montpelier on <clears throat> what most teachers make without a second income. Um, and this, the second part was there was a 16% increase in healthcare costs. That is most of what the increase between last year and this year is, but it is not because we added things. I agree. Back. Jim, could you speak about the cliff in, in 2030? So, okay, so here's, here's what I didn't explain. So what was happening with the cap, and this is where the legislature came in and changed things, was it was stretching the education fund this way, but the cap was supposed to stay in place for five years, which meant that for the next five years, people were just going to continue devouring the F fund. The legislature realized that and realized that that would be catastrophic. So what the legislature did, and they did this very recently, it was signed into law, I think, last week, was they got rid of the cap. Um, and then they replaced it for a few districts with a cent decrease that's going to phase out over a few years. But that cent decrease is not a cap. It's just however much you want to spend, we'll diminish it a little, and then we'll, we'll up it over the next few years. So most of the spending increases that districts have taken on, they're going to have to bear. This is good news and bad news. It's, it's bad news this year because what, what the cap was going to do is, is if the cap stayed in place, we'd kind of do this at the 5%, and then we'd hit a point where like the Ed Fund was, was done at, fi at year five, and then we'd have a huge spike. And the spike was showing that unless we were cutting like, you know, four or so million, which just for, to put it out there, is like, 40 teachers. We were four million out of what's the total school budget? Thirty-two. 32. Yeah, which is which is like 40, 40, 40 people. Um, that we would have an enormous tax increase at the end because the Ed Fund would be would be toast. Uh, what the removal of the cap is. So the bad news is we have more of a hit this year. Um, the good news is that that flaw, that flaw of eating the Ed Fund, is not going to happen. The Ed Fund is going to stabilize. And actually, one of the reasons we can't really give a fair estimate of what the tax increase is, is because now that the Ed Fund is, now that the cap has been removed, a lot of districts, particularly the districts that put in a lot of bells and whistles and are now having to either get rid of those costs or pass them along to their taxpayers are removing those bells and whistles. So that dollar yield that did this is now starting to creep up again. And we don't know where that final number is going to land. Um, we probably won't know till May or June, but the further that goes up, the lower our taxes go up. Right now, if it stays at where it is, our taxes are gonna be they are high. And the other thing that in their taxes is CLA would give that like 23, 24%, which makes my heart stop. And I, I get why everyone is freaking out about that. I'm freaking out about it. I, I don't I don't like it. Um, we expect that dollar yield to go to keep going up, which means that that tax number will go down. Where that ends up is really tough to tell. 
Again, that depends on what the other districts, because a lot of other districts right now, again, that inflated their budget are reducing it. So that amount of reduction is gonna influence that. And also this, the legislature understands the situation. So there have been promises and we all know what political promises are. We, we wait until we see them in, in print. But um, I think there are sincere, a sincere desire uh, particularly on the part of the Washington County um, delegation to find as much money right now to put at the ad fund for this year to make that better. But the good news is that five-year spike, because the formula has changed, because the cap has been removed, this is really going to be the year of a big hit. And then it's going, it's going to stabilize. Um, yeah, as as yeah because that cap's not there because it's not going to be drained so it's a it's a good long-term move by the legislature it makes this year more painful the question i think that i have yeah is next year and then the, we don't know what next year is but we know that it's not returning to the level it was two years ago or last year we know that that the our count you know our funding is not going to return, relatively speaking, to the level it was. I don't know if we know that or not. I think I think it might be. I think the the state education fund might be similar to what we end up seeing this year. And again, it's not what we were seeing in the past. It's not what we were seeing in the past. Um, no. Um, can you explain CLA? Just, just briefly, why yes. that tax rate is different in Roxbury and that it is yeah. in Montpelier? Uh, so the CLA is called the Common Level of Appraisal, uh, and with the caveat that I'm not an accountant, this is this is my explanation as a a layperson on the board. Uh, what it it attempts to do is to take the difference between the appraised value and the market value of your home. So every 10 years we do an appraisal and here's, here's where Montpelier is getting, is getting hit. Um, so with, with our uh, recent reappraisal, they had actually kicked in so the benefit was seen last year. Um, right now we have a, let's get the math right. We basically have a, a CLA at, at like 113, which, and which, you know, is, is based on our reappraisal and then increase in market value. So what we're seeing is, is we're seeing a big bump because of that reappraisal that's essentially creating an automatic. 100 to 113, an automatic 13 percent raise in taxes. If if we didn't if if we didn't add anything to it from the budget, we've got like a 13 percent raise baked in. So that's just that's just because of the adjustment in property values due to the CLA. Uh, Roxbury does not have that going on because their social <laughs> cycle is is different. Um, so that's, that's the CLA. That's the other big piece of <coughs> our tax, tax rate that, that we really can't do anything about. I mean, we, if, if we did everything we could to, to cut, I mean, like cutting like millions of dollars in the school budget, it would be very hard to get below that 13%. Hold on. We'll come back to it. Yeah. You'll, you'll be able to ask questions, all the questions you want, but let's continue the flow of this so yeah. that we cover what we... Yeah, and I also want to be transparent too. Like, Roxbury has, has, has historically had a lower tax rate than Montpelier for uh, a variety of reasons, but um, they have historically had a lower tax rate than Montpelier. I'd like to open on, on 127, dealing with the um, 
the revenues, the surplus, um, that uh, the, the reserve funds that the board had. Uh, basically, the 1.9 encumbered for the high school track that was less than $400,000 so that they could have a safe and a safe track. Yeah. Um, the idea, uh, how much of that reserve was used to balance this budget? Uh, just under a half a million. So basically, the, the budget was balanced at under a half a million. I have a concern. Not that I wouldn't have supported yeah. that. Had I been sitting on that board, given the same circumstances, with the $1.5 million staying in the budget initially, I probably would have used that reserve as well. I would have questioned that, but I would have used that reserve instead of chopping teachers. Well, I mean, I think there's two things. One, I mean, you don't want to chop teachers. We, were, we, we talked about using more of the reserve. Um, we decided against it for a couple of reasons. One, you know, we are we are hoping the Ed Fund stabilizes. We're not sure the Ed Fund stabilizes. It, it, it's been it's been a circus at at the legislature with with Act One Twenty Seven. The other thing is we have you know we realize right now that the budget is tight and we really want to contain costs while continuing education excellence over the next year. We've got PCB tests at the high school. We definitely were sobered by the fact that U32, which was built very much at the same time as Montpelier High School, has a PCB problem. Uh, if, if we've got reserve funds to deal with that PCB problem, we don't have to bond it. Bonding it's going to increase taxes. So we, uh, we wanted to keep a little bit of money around for the next few years for because it's, they're going to be tight years for unanticipated fixes. We know we've got the PCB thing lurking. Um, and, you know, we're hopeful that Act 127 is, is going to stabilize and that, you know, Act 850 did what it needed to reach or Act 50 did what it needed to do. Um, we're not sure. I have from, from the paper, I have an authority I'm going to quote now. Um, Spending it all now is not going to avoid everything we talked about for the next five years, said Murphy. <laughs> That's it, she is. Yeah. And then uh, Mia Moore, uh, the but vice chair. Was, was this pre or because a lot of things <laughs> were said. This was free. This was, yeah, <laughs> a lot of things were said right. when and the then, cap was around that are not necessarily. And then Mia said, if the district spends that money now, then it's gone. We don't get to use it again. And I agree. I mean, yeah. that, even now, that that's that's yeah. very prudent. It's it's not a, yeah. You know, the thing about revenue is, if if you spend one time money on ongoing things, you you, you just buy yourself a year. Jill Remick on the board yeah. said she hoped the district wouldn't continue to a death by a thousand cuts. And that's everyone's fear. Yes. That's, that's the educational quality that you speak yeah. of. Uh, when I present my side, I'm much more fiscally cautious than this approach. I'm much more aware of if things do not go the way that we want them to go, that we have not only a full reserve, but we have passed a full reserve. That we have a million dollars passed after we've reinvested the 500000 that we spent on this budget as a hedge against future budget cuts that appear down this road. We want to keep the budget stable, the, the quality stable that we were purchasing before Act 127. We want the quality that we had. We're in a world of diminished resources now. And basically what I am saying is that 1.5 million to support 40 some odd children. Now keep in mind, it's not 1.5 million because you still have to educate those children once they're at Union. Yeah. You have to net that out, the cost of their education at Union. But we're talking approximately a million dollars net for 40 children as a buttress <clears throat> against educational cuts. And I'm not going to say for Montpelier children, because it's not Montpelier children. It's Montpelier children 
at, at Union Roxbury and Montpelier students at both the high school and the middle school. And I'm going to return back to, if, if we're done, I'm going to return to Act 46. And Act 46 was the act back in 2017 that passed 83 to 50 in the House. And basically, the Joint Fiscal Committee said that the legislature spent $31 million in property tax breaks to support the merger of those districts, uh, 206 districts in 108 to 85 towns have formed 50 new union school districts, a reduction of 158. And basically, it was an attempt, the, the state legislature's attempt, to bring rationale. It was not the first attempt. I mean, they've been doing this gradually over time. They've been trying to shrink the number of union school districts that we have simply to get rid of the administrative overhead, if nothing else, but also to deal with the micro schools. And that was a very, very controversial part of Act 46. There were hours of testimony on what would happen in those communities to the micro elementary schools. And basically what happened was that the legislature decided that they would do a, not, a, not so much for us, it was, it was almost like the stick. If you were under a certain level, you really were asked to dance in the merger dance. Districts that were above a certain level were exempted from this particular uh, ordeal, I suppose, or challenge, I suppose is a better word. And basically what the legislature decided to do is to sweeten it and give us incentives to bring about and rid inefficiency, economic inefficiencies in the system while trying to keep up educational quality. You know, it was, it was a push me, pull me. But what they did was it was signed in 2017 and we have not one, but two people in this room who actually were in that room that go from possibly three. three. I think Nancy. Yeah. Right, so we have three people in this room who were in that room negotiating this and basically in May of 2017, a formal 23-page report that they drafted went to the Board of Education, was approved, went for a vote, and both the town and the city approved this. Yes. In 2018, if everybody's following me, in exchange for that approval, our tax rate was knocked 10 cents. Yeah, with 10, 8, 6. Then in 2019, it was eight. Yep. Then in 2020, it was six. Then in 2021, it was four. In 2022, it was a mere two cents. And then the state subsidy disappeared. And it was easy. People sit and approach me and say, in 2023, where were you saying this school is still in the budget? You know, and basically, no one was noticing it because Jim brought in a budget in 2023 of 1.8%, and then the state tacked on another 9%, 9 some odd percent, and it went unnoticed. And it went unnoticed simply because the budget was born to that level, and it accommodated to that level. However, this budget is not accommodating to that level, we've had a C-shift. And basically, the C-shift is such that we're laying off teachers. The C-shift is such that we're buying out our most experienced yeah, teachers. Yeah. Yes, we have offered a buyout to our most experienced teachers. We have, we have done that, but... I mean, it's, there's, it's, there's other factors at play. This is, this is more complicated than... But it is, however, when on the bottom line is the bottom line is that we have to we have to balance a budget. Now that's not to say that I'm criticizing you for doing that because again, were that 1.5 million frozen in that budget and forcing these kinds of decisions, I would likely have joined you in these kinds of decisions. The question now 
is when the town of Roxbury was sold this budget in 2017, they had, according, again, according to the paper, they had gone to Roxbury and Roxbury had said, now we're going to take questions later. I know, but it's ten after seven. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so, could we? Did Absolutely. This being fascinating, Absolutely. Roxbury. Yeah, it's very fascinating, but I think right. that people need to talk about what's going on now. Okay, Roxbury was told that, in essence, that this might not be forever. And in that negotiation, in the document is written that Roxbury can purchase that school for one dollar. That is yeah. written into the negotiation, yeah. and it was written in with the notion in Roxbury that, that there was a strong possibility that this would indeed close someday. In Montpelier, I looked... There is a looked, strong possibility that this will indeed close someday. Pardon? That there is a strong possibility that the school, which is what the board is looking into right now. The question is, we all took that tax break. We took 10 okay. cents, 8 cents, 6 cents. It seems like we had a community understanding, and I looked at the paper, I looked at the contemporary records, there was no record of this school being sold as staying open past the tax break that was offered by the state that was subsidizing it. So basically what I'm saying is that $1.5 million for this year, I've read that the school is closing in a month. It wouldn't be closing in a month. It's going to be open the entire school year. It would be closed. It would be closed in September. It's six months away, and basically, I am saying that the 1.5 million dollars would be an excellent hedge for us in the district for our school children to protect future budgets from cuts. And that's all I'm going to say. Okay. And I'll just I'll just say three things because we are we are worried about cost containment. Yeah, as I, I've stated. You know, the board and I'll, I'll give a little history. There, there are two things agreed upon in the, in the rock about the Rice Ravel School and the merger that it would stay open for four years and that the town could buy it back for a dollar if, if, if it ever closed and the town offered it. There was no promise of what was going to happen beyond the four years. There were talks in 2019 of putting together a committee to investigate the future of the school and to see its viability. Then, if folks remember, we had a pandemic. This chewed up enormous school resources, including the board. Those conversations got pushed back. When we finally started coming out of, of the, uh, the pandemic, uh, what, we, what the board embarked upon was a values and mission-driven discussion because we frankly didn't have it in writing. Uh, with the idea that we would have the Roxbury Village School for you of a conversation driven by those values that we put together. We put together a great process. We've done that. Uh, we are now moving to that part of looking again at the future of Roxbury Village School for next budget. So there's three things that there, there are three cost containment, potential cost containment things that the board is seriously looking at. Because again, like we see the numbers and, and we're worried about it. One 7 is- 7.15. Huh? We pick, it's 7.15. Can Dean Wigier be allowed to ask their questions? Let me just, let me just put this out. Please don't. Well, this is important. This is we, important Everybody because, who's here has studied it carefully or they wouldn't be here. Then what are the three things I'm gonna say? I don't care. I want people here to be able okay. to ask well, their I, questions. I think other people might care. Um, How many people here want to ask their questions? Yeah. So the three things we're looking at are sending Roxbury Village school people to Roxbury Village students to Union Alumni School in a way that ensures that those students in that transition is best for the students and the families in Roxbury. Two, we have declining enrollment and we are going to be continuing to look at staff reductions. And three, we have reached out to our neighbors in Washington Central and we want to have a serious discussion about possible merger there because that could also be a big potential savings. We don't know, but we want to look at it. We have those answers. Those are three things we're going to do within the next year. I think all three of them meet the goals of, of maintaining educational excellence, 
and cost containment. So with there, I will open up for questions. I definitely want you know time for feedback. But sorry if I was a little little short there. But I, I think that those are important points. And I think that's the thing people in the room. Were, if were people will stand up and say where you're from. Questions? Oh, I'm sure someone's got a question. Up, up, up. There's a move over here, so it can be. Um, so my name is Ben Pincus. Um, I'm a proud graduate of Roxbury Village School. And um, I sent my sons to Roxbury Village School a number of years ago, too. So, um, and I've returned to Roxbury. My father passed away some 10 years ago. And I know there's a lot of people who might want to speak, so I want to make this quickly, but it's really important for me to make it. Um, I'm a little bit upset about the format of this. It feels kind of one-sided, sided, a little bit like Richard. This is kind of your show if you're advocating for the rapid closure of Roxbury Village School. And um, you said some things in the editorial that I'm really upset about. Um, you, you say the million plus subsidy is not an educational decision made by the board, the school board, I assume you mean, is instead a defiant political statement on rural social justice. We, we, just a couple words about Roxbury. I, I love my town, I grew up there. And not one thing, Richard, in, this, in your editorial, if you communicate anything about our community and how important that is. I'm speaking from my heart. We're, we're a struggling community and there's so much about subsidy, subsidy this, subsidy that in the editorials that makes it seem like you're dismissive of the fact that we do have high needs. You know, we're, we're a poor town in a relatively poor county. To dismiss this as something negative, to have rural social justice is hurtful. It's insulting for struggling working people in this, in this state and in the town of Roxbury. Um, I, you know, I, I also want to say, I think Union Elementary School is a wonderful school, as is Roxbury, uh, Montpelier High School. In no way am I critical of those as school choices. So I agree with you, Richard. They're wonderful choices. But I'm concerned about sending a five-year-old, almost three-hour trip, round trip, by school bus, a five-year-old child from Roxbury. That that's concerns me. I, no, no, let me finish. Um, the only time you mention anything about anything personal or compassionate about our community, you say, Roxbury parents have nothing to fear in fully integrating into our district this fall. I'll tell you what I fear. I, I fear having a young child have to travel that far. I fear the breakdown of the cohesion of Roxbury as a result of the school closing fast. I have no doubt the school will have to close, but I just plead with you all, please tell your friend, vote in support of the school budget. Just for this year, I have no doubt that the school will close, but we just need that one year. Um, and Brett, I don't know, Fred, you know, we've been working, the one question is, what would this make a difference in your taxes? I don't know, 6% for one year increase uh, to sustain Frostbury Village School. But I, I see some head shaking, but I just want to let you know, at one point, there were 11 school districts in Roxbury, all these many little schools. That was the nature of New England schooling at one point. I went to Roxbury Village School when it was a two-room schoolhouse. Mr. Smith and Miss Hannah, Hannah Morvan and Rich Smith. And I'm proud of going to one of the last two-room schoolhouses in the state of Vermont. And then around, I think, 1980, the renovation happened and expanded it. It's small, rural schools, everything I've been doing research on property values within proximity to the school. When the school closes, how hurtful that is for property values. All I'm asking is for that one more year and all I'm asking for is you all to vote in support of the school budget for this year. And I just, I feel like we're a community, we have history, um, and it, there's a, the pan-African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child. It's a global proverb. And in, with the breakdown of village life and community life as a result of modern America, our village is really our public school system. That's where we meet, we connect with parents, we, we provide a support network when our teens are tr troubled. This is the center of our community. So all I plead is just don't take that away from us so quickly, thank you.
Jesus, uh, the only way that I can respond to that is to say that a number of communities across the state face this same challenge. The districts face this challenge. Well, I mean, again, and this is again, this is the Jim, study that, Jim, that those communities go through before they make this decision. They don't do it But they made it that decision. And they made that decision and years ago. And we can make that decision, too. At we a cost of $1.5 million. You're minimizing the value Richard, we're going to disagree. Let's, let's hear from some people in the, in the, the audience, please. Yeah. If you'd stand up and say who you are, please. Who, who, are you, who are you pointing to? Go ahead. Why don't you go in? Okay. I'm from Roxbury. And your name is? Tom Frazier. Thank you. And I've been to these meetings and spoken several times about this, and it's to absolutely no avail. But rather than take an emotional approach to Roxbury, which is, you know, us losing our town center, I happen to live right across from the school, and I was instrumental in building the school. And rather than do that, I want to use your own numbers, okay? So these numbers are from the school board's... Um, Budget. On page, on slide 14, K through 4 at UES, 332 kids. On slide 16, RVS, 42 kids. School ex, uh, expense per school. RVS, slide 20, okay. RVS, $37,426. UES, UES, $32,368. That's a $5,000 difference, okay? Now, take it a little farther. 32 and, and, and 332 plus 42, 374 students. From slide 20, the cost per student is, uh, or no, if you take the total cost of the UES program at 332 students at 32,368 30, 32, comes out to 10,746,000, 46,176 dollars. 10,746,176. If you do RVS plus U, UES, at the $32,000, which is your number for your, to educate a kid in UES, that's on, pay, on slide 20. Don't, don't interrupt me. It's slide 20. It's, it's there. The number is $12,105,632. $12, so $10 million from $12 million leaves you $1,359,456, which is the increase to the to the UES budget over to take in our kids. It's not 1.5 million. And the cost of our school is not 1.5. If you take the 13 million or 1.35946 million from 1.5, your savings gets comes down to $140,000. You can look at the numbers. Sir, I'm using the state numbers and they're on the state site. It, well, it's, then you better look at the, the, the Montpelier board the numbers. numbers sir. Those aren't those don't do us right. Sorry. They're selling this on a per student cost. Everything is per student. Yeah. It, it doesn't matter if you've got, you know. Yeah, even if there's a break, it is it is a difficult. Uh, uh, and I I believe those numbers or they're they be provided in the sub one, but the overall cost. It is around 1.5 million, and, and I, I. It's not 1.5 million. How much does it cost? It costs a per student cost to educate a kid in UES. How much is it? See, it's 32 million. I don't have it right out for me. I've, I've seen it. Well, and, it's yeah. slide 20. Go home and look at slide 20. And now, okay. I mean, both the business manager and the superintendent have broken down the math. It's it's it, it's 1.5. I mean, we can. We can. You're not going to. You have well, to we can, the, we can debate the merits spend. of the cost, but the, the you, number the number has been confirmed. You have to spend it at UES, though. How can you have? How can you not say that you're not you're not going to educate those kids? You're going to put them. You're going to put them in a closet and not spend any money on them. Yeah. No, the, the, That's basically what you're saying. 
because it's not going to, uh, putting 42 kids in that school is not going to increase your costs at all. 36. It's just unbelievable. It, it will increase costs if we can absorb those students without adding staff. Not on a per student basis, it's still going to come out to the same number. I just, I just told you. Yeah, but there, there are other expenses involved. It, it is, I mean, I, I, this is not a dog in the fight. This is just, this is talking to the business manager, talking to the superintendent, seeing well, the numbers they have. Why do they put these numbers out then? If the business manager and the superintendent have so much on the ball, why did they put these numbers in that, in that handout? I mean, I, I, I don't think they've been broken down exactly as it comes out. I think you're looking at numbers and you're making extrapolations. No, I'm not. You, I, I don't think you, yeah. you are not going to save $1.5 million. It's just an absolute fiction. Right behind the gentleman from Roxbury, would you stand, identify yourself, and what city you're from, please? Deb Sarge of Montpelier. Um, I have so many I, thoughts rolling through me. Um, Phil Scott signed a bill enabling schools to, to postpone budget votes. Why has Montpelier not considered that? We didn't consider it. We decided not to. The reason that we decided not to, as I explained earlier, um, we felt that we had made the reasonable and responsible cuts that were given. There, was not, there were not obvious places to cut. Uh, we did not want to cut the Roxbury Village School in, we had essentially, we had essentially eight days to make a decision or we would not be able to make reduction in forces, which would basically be the closure of Montpelier or Roxbury or any other reduction in forces given our union contract, which we're locked into. We did not want to make a decision this large. And I think some of the reasons that, that the Roxbury community, which are our neighbors and our friends, and which we four years ago jointly agreed to enter into a district with as neighbors and friends, I think they feel they deserve that conversation. I think they feel they deserve the study, they deserve the conversation, they deserve the time to think about some of those questions. We were not gonna make that decision unilaterally in eight days. Otherwise, there wasn't anything to cut and it would have been the same budget. So, so we put it forward. I understand that there was the issue of the pandemic and, and that was, has certainly been an ongoing issue, but, but compacted with our schools and Roxbury being part of that. Yeah. Um, why are you using that as a reason to not ask them to follow the original agreement. What? What are we not asking them to follow the agreement? I, as I, as no, I, they, they did not agree to close the school. They never agreed I, to close I the school. The students were supposed to be coming over here within three three years. That's, maybe that's maybe it's four or five, but yeah. has it yeah. not been five years? The the only thing we agreed to was that the board did not have the power to close the school for four years. There was no, there was beyond that four years. That is true. Yeah, but there's a, all that, all that happens is past four years is the board can close the school. We didn't agree to close the school. We didn't say we were going to close the school. Um, we, there was no agreement. There was no agreement. You know, I mean, quite honestly, if this, if the purpose of this merger was to close Roxbury Village School, I think we would have done it at the time of the merger. That was not the purpose of the merger. The purpose of the merger was to to achieve other savings. I, as a member of the person on the committee, I think there was a hope that we would find a way to keep this school viable and open long term. And I see Tina nodding her head. That was that was hope. We we knew the school had challenges. Uh, we wanted to give it four years and and see what happened, and then have a discussion. As a there was no president, I did not understand that. I'm sorry, but that is not what I understood. And as a Montpelier re senior yes. with limited income, fixed income, my, one of my fears is we are going to lose a significant number of people in this town because when the the uh, reappraisal and the tax rate come about. We are going to see a lot of for sale sign coming up this summer after that happens. And Locksbury people or somebody else is going to come and buy those homes because we're going to lose 
a lot of our population because they're not going to be able to stay here in Montpelier, and that's tragic. No, and I have concerns about the tax rate too. Again, we but and that's, you have and that's largely out of your hands. Your yeah, it's largely out of our hands. I mean, it's largely, it's you know, most of the factors impacting the tax rate are beyond. Yeah, One point five million might help. It would help. I don't think it's. it's not it's, having a track on the on the budget. On the, the track, we, we the tracks not. But also, I mean, if we want new families in. If we have dilapidated schools that we're not funding, that's not going to help either. Department under the under the um, school that actually meets the needs of our elementary school students and our middle school students would help. Taking that money and applying it to those things because my grandkids can't even go to the playgrounds after school because Act Two or whatever it's called kicked them off the playground because they needed the playground and there's no other playgrounds, that money might help in recreation in Montpelier. When my kids went to school here, because they went all through the system, they could go to the recreation department after school and do all kinds of activities at, for one fee for the year. I was on the rec board, so it wasn't part of the school system at that time. There are all kinds of things that this community needs that I'm not sure having Roxbury as part of us is going to help if we have to keep funding their community center, keep funding that school. Uh, somebody else needs to talk. Uh, what, what I think that the speaker is referring to is Jim's statement in the press that um, the committee will explore the option of moving RBS elementary students to Union Elementary School in the year 2026 and repurposing that building in a manner that is most be beneficial. 2025. Right. It was 2026, but it's 2025 actually. And repurposing that building in a manner that is most beneficial for the town of Broxbury. Is the board proposing to go beyond selling? that to Roxbury for a dollar to actually repurposing the building before and having the taxpayers pay for that repurposing? Uh, no, I mean, I don't think we're, we're planning on, I, I think in terms of that, it's, you know, does the town of Roxbury want to buy it back for a dollar? We can't make them. If not- I'll pay the dollar if they don't, you know, give it to them. Uh, I, it, it doesn't say offer it to Richard Cheer, it says the town of Roxbury. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sign it, deed it. I think we'd want to work with the Roxbury community and see, you know, if we were to sell it to someone else, making sure that the town of Roxbury had a voice in who that was and what they were planning to use it for. I think it's beneficial for the town of Roxbury. I think that's part of the process. Like, I don't, we don't just want to leave Roxbury in the lurch and and give that school up because it's 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 a nice building and it it, it should be part of a vibrant Roxbury community. Um, Saying that goodness. doesn't mean that we're promising to to incur additional expenditures to make that happen, but I think we want to be partners in the next step on that building if it does close. We have another to make sure it's useful. Yes. Um, hi, <clears throat> I'm Harry. I live on Barry Street. Um, I'm, I'm not a citizen, and I'm getting ready to vote for the first time in Montpelier. I'm very excited about it. Great. Um, anyway, um, I'm also a teacher in public school. I teach at Braintree Elementary. Um, which is just down the road from Roxbury. Um, and um, obviously, hiring season is coming up for um, school districts. Um, March and April is a time when people tend to hand in their notice for the following year. Um, <clears throat> and it's really hard to find good teachers right now. There's a shortage. I teach in preschool. It's really hard to find people who will stick with it. Um, COVID has changed a lot of things in schools. You know, we, we, we've heard this evening about um, how our tax rate was what it was, and now it's different. Um, budgets have changed. The needs in schools are more. There are more behaviors that we're seeing. There are more needs. We need more resources in schools, basically. Um, anyway, um, my question is, I don't really have a sense of what happens if the budget doesn't get passed 
other than students' educations and the quality of the education being disrupted somehow, can you speak to what the impact will be if this budget doesn't get passed, if we vote no? Uh, we will have to go in and find some cuts. I think by law we're required to cut at least a dollar and uh, send it back to the voters and see if it passes. If it, if it doesn't pass a second time, then we go into a very kind of um, contingency land that I don't think we want to be in, that I don't fully understand, but it's kind of, we run on like an emergency bare bones budget. So the, the you, consequences you of it not never pass the budget, I believe you work on the same budget that last year's was. It yeah. wasn't, it isn't that the school doesn't get any money. Right. Yeah. Okay. Might I take it from a political sense? If this budget were to go down 52 to 48 in Montpelier, I assume it will pass in Roxbury. If, if it goes down in Montpelier 52 to 48, that is something completely different than if it goes down 60, 40 or higher, in which case taking this back to the Montpelier voters with the Roxbury Village School in it will go down to defeat over and over and over. I assume that if this budget goes down significantly in Montpelier, that the board will seriously consider removing that line item, in which case, I believe, and I would encourage people to vote for that budget. I am not going to in any way, shape, or form, or no one that I'm al aligned with is going to in any way, shape, or form say what to do with that $1.5 million because that's an educational decision that should belong to the elected board that includes Roxbury as well as Montpelier. But that, I think, is, is the fate of this thing. It's going to be determined if it passes, then it passes. If it goes down, the question is how heavy will it go down? And I can guarantee you that Montpelier would not be the only town that, that rejects this school budget across the state on town meeting day. I, I think a lot of school budgets will go down. I mean, I I am hopeful that the citizens of, of Montpelier will, will understand that we have a, a serious and thoughtful process in place about the future of Roxbury Village School and that we, that there is a substantial chance that that process will result in, in Roxbury Elementary students going to UES starting in 2025-26. Um, and that that is the compassionate way to handle that issue with our neighbors. And it is also a potential cost containment device down the road. I am hopeful that people will get that. One more. No, that's you. Oh, me? Dan. Oh, I can't Two more. Down. Uh, three more. Three more and we're done. Yeah. Hi, Dan Jones, candidate for mayor. I mm -hmm. am... Um, one, thank you, uh, Jim, for uh, including the issue of joining and exploring with U32. I think that's an important path, piece that we really have to be much more aggressive on. Secondly, um, I'm coming at this from uh, both what my critique is in our town government and uh, to some degree the schools. I think we've over-bureaucratized a lot of things. We're, we're, uh, we have many people at uh, certain levels of management, and I, I was told this story about uh, Roxbury in con uh, comparison to the Elmore schools by Ken Jones, so I, I will reference uh, where it came from. He said, Elmore has one of the most cost-efficient small schools, about the same size as Roxbury, in the state, because they basically have the special needs students go into Morrisville for care, and two, they don't have a principal. I mean, they have a, one of the teachers acting as principal. From what I understand, the, we're, we're forcing uh, Roxbury to have a principal, and um, that we are, uh, you know, so I would like to see us be able to look at more, a wider range of options in terms of management, not only for Roxbury, but across the board, because I think, as was pointed out here, we have a lot of citizens who are really feeling the pinch this year on the tax. I'm, I'm just hearing it all over. Oh, yeah. So I, I understand. You, as you are. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it, it's like, holy crap, what's going on? So, you know, but I also listen to the Roxbury parents in the same way that I was in Boston during the 70s uh, when they had the whole busing crisis and they were destroying the community schools in order to try and equalize things 
which to some degree is like this funding mechanism under 127. So what has happened was you found the core of the communities and the schools destroyed because they were being bused around town. And so I hear the, the pain of the uh, Roxbury uh, parents in saying, you know, shouldn't we be doing something to keep that town center going? So like I said, I really encourage you if uh, the citizens decide that the school budget is not passed, to really take a look deeply at what your management uh, choices are, what you are demanding for management, because I think we're getting overburdened, just like we are in the healthcare sector, just like we are in the higher education sector, with too many bureaucrats and not enough teachers. Uh, uh, so I like this feel of that. Behind the gentleman, you had a question? Thank you. Yeah. Did you have a question? Um, I did not, but I'll ask one on the spur of the moment. I'm Steve Cease, I live in Montpelier, and thanks for this forum. And um, sort of a, a two-part question. A, if the, if the vote went against the school budget significantly, could the board find an equivalent million and a half other than closing the Roxbury School, if that is, seems to be a target? Secondly, what happens if you do close the Roxbury School? What happens to that school? What happens to the teachers? How does that get them from them? I'd really like to know how that works on the ground, if it happens. Uh, I believe the administration has a contingency cut plan. I'm not sure that it's exactly 1.5 million, but I think it would entail some potentially painful <coughs> cuts if that happens. I mean, if we're forced to cut, we're going to have to find cuts somewhere. Um, but the, you know, the, the, the recommendation right now from the administration is that any, any further cuts from what we've done uh, would, would be rushed and would impact educational excellence and our ability to, to teach our kids. Uh, you know, if the Roxbury Village School did close, I mean, I am not comfortable answering that without having the superintendent and the principal of that school really talk about what happened. But, uh, you know, those those students would, you know, they they end up at, at UES at the beginning of, of next year. Um, you know, how that transition would take place, what support would be given to the families. Um, I don't have the answers to those questions. And what, what would become of the building? I don't have the answer to that question. Could we pull those teachers into UES to help continue to educate those kids? Uh, With the help? Yeah. <laughs> uh, there would probably be a reduction in, in force. Um, we have quite a few teachers who are leaving this year, yeah. retiring, so we have spaces for them. Yes. Roxbury teachers, I believe. You had a question. I just want to say that I am a, I'm Katie Swick and I'm a Montpelier resident and a teacher at Roxbury. And I just want people to know that Roxbury School has very high quality teachers and a high quality education. And you had, you, yes, even though my kids go there, um, it is not necessarily better. A school, the Roxbury is a very good school too, and the kids are getting high education. High school. Sometimes in the paper, it doesn't sound like that, so I, I wanted to put it out there. In the back. That's you, Phil. See you, Phil. Yep, I'm Phil Dodd. I live in Montpelier. Just so quickly on Act 46, when that actually passed the legislature, Montpelier was not required to merge. It was a law designed to close small schools, but that was not a requirement. So if we had not voted as a town to, to merge, Roxbury would have been forced by the state to go with somebody else I doubt they would have linked them up with us. Um, my concern when we did pass that is, you know, what was going to happen down the road? And now we're down the road, and we've got a tough choice here. Um, I, I'm, I guess, you know, facing this big 24% increase or whatever it ends up to be, I don't know how much confidence we can have that it actually will close in a year. I mean, I, I understand there's a committee form. It's got representatives 50-50, and the people in Roxbury are very passionate about keeping their school. So... I don't, I don't have the level of confidence I'd like to have that it's going to get changed in the future. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't guarantee what the result of that is. I mean, I can say we, you know, we do have cost containment issues that we need to deal with. Um, you know, the Act 127, even with, with the fix, is going to... Uh, going to result in, in in cost containments we have not faced, and we're going to have to look at ways to 
figure that out and, and have educational excellence. Um, yeah, I, I completely agree with, with Katie that, that there are kids there that are getting a great education and there are staff members there that are fantastic. Katie's fantastic, the principal's fantastic, the, the staff there is, is great. Um, it's an expensive school that is going against the trend of what is proving sustainable in, in the state. And, and I think that's just a fact we're going to have to grapple with as, as we look long term. Um, we have, we're having this process to have this process, but uh, there are a lot of trends out there that the board and the administration are, are very aware of. And um, I think we'll we'll make the best decision, even if it's a tough decision. I, but I, you know, I, we're having the we're having the process to, to get to that decision. So I'm not going to say what it is until we get there. But you know, the 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 trends are there to see if you want to if you if you take a look. Well, one final one, Nathan in the back, please. Um, State your name. My name is Nathan Suter. I live here in Montpelier. Um, I think that what I'm struck by is the where we are, we Montpelier and Roxbury are in this, we're in this strange fulcrum position where the decisions the school board made and our district made about the needs of our students happened with their best understanding of what Act 127 would mean, with the best interest of the students at heart, with a sustainable model for our district. And then the state legislature realized they had screwed things up and they changed the game. And we are still, as a community, two communities, faced with meeting the needs of our students. And I'm, I trust that the district, in fact, I watched the, the school board and the administration shape this budget and vote on it. And I think that those needs have not changed and the good responses that they've had in the budget have not changed. And so, as a community, it's not our fault that the state hasn't figured out well how to fund education despite tinkering with it. And so I hope that uh, we give grace to the folks who are leaders in our district and the hard work that they've done. And uh, so anyway, I thank you both for being here tonight, but especially Jim, who's been doing the hard work. With that, I want to close just with one comment. This is being held in the Hayes Conference Room of the Kellogg Hubbard Library. I would urge everyone watching this who lives in Montpelier to vote yes for the levy that supports the Kellogg Hubbard Library and allows it to hold meetings such as this, civic meetings, and be truly the heart of our community. Uh, thank you very much for coming tonight, and make sure that you and your neighbors get out and vote, no matter how you vote, get out and vote on town meeting day. Yeah, no, thank you everyone for coming.